if they're moving grass stems. Um, and, and they would just be like looking and looking and your eyes get drawn in to deeper and deeper details. And you start to see like, oh, wait, is this a hair? Oh no, it's just a fragment of a, of a plant. And you keep looking and then all of some kid found like some crazy, super tiny insect that you can't even believe it's real, you know, just like a little green speck, but it's moving. And there would be, and then it'd be other red bugs and spiders and just so much happening. And the time would just keep going and people would, would just keep looking and finding more and more little treasures, tiny fragments of shells, all kinds of stuff. And eventually somebody would find a hair and, uh, and then you'd, and then you'd stand up and you'd look around and you'd be like, wow, you can't believe how much is happening in the world. You, you're look, you just spent all this time looking at like one square foot of earth and it would just blow you away with how much detail and nuance went into that spot. And then you look up and you're like, oh my God, this is a whole field or a whole forest, right? And so if you imagine that the world is created with, with so much intricacy and so much life, and then you think about a normal field, a normal agricultural field that's growing an annual crop and what happens every single year is that field is erased. All the life on it is, is shut down, totally started over, right? So to make a field to receive seeds, to receive annual seeds or just any seeds, we kind of have to disturb that soil. And so a corn field or a soy field is basically like an obliteration of life. And uh, this really bothered me. And uh, and I wasn't the only person that thought this. So there's this concept called tree crops. And instead of growing our food on uh, with annual plants, we start looking at ways we could use trees to do it. Because if you think about doing it with trees, you can actually keep an ecology in place year after year after year, and it can build and grow. And uh, chestnuts is one is one example. There's lots of examples. But chestnuts is one that I'm speaking about today. I could have picked a lot of other things. Um, the chestnuts are really easy to talk about. So I'm just going to talk about them now. Um, we go to the next slide. And so a lot of people are very unfamiliar with chestnuts because they're not really common in our country anymore. But what you can think of them as is they're kind of like oak trees. They're very closely related to oaks and beeches. They're in the same family and they have very similar growth habits. They, they live to be, uh, they can be over a thousand years old. They have very strong branching patterns. They, they make nuts. The chestnut is actually a lot like an acorn. I'm going to get to the nuts a little later, but, uh, but you can think of them as sturdy, long-lived trees that are very drought tolerant. And they like to grow on ridges and hillsides and basically the same places where you'll find uh, most kinds of oaks. Um, next slide, please. One of the reasons I got really interested in chestnuts, these are chestnut flowers. These are the male catkins, um, is because see these flowers are coming out right now. And this is happening. This picture is taken around the 4th of July. So where I live, it's not like a good fruit growing region. It's not like by some big lake or by the coast or some valley in California. It's just a bunch of hills in New York State. And so we get very uh, severe fluctuations in temperature in the spring. Some years it'll be 75, 80 degrees in March. Uh, trees will start waking up in April. They'll start blooming. And then boom, it just drops back down to 20 degrees, 15 degrees, and flower buds are killed. Apples are uh, a wonderful tree. They're all over the place here where I live, but a lot of years they don't set a crop. And that's because their flowers get hit by spring frosts. But chestnuts are flowering so late that they set a crop pretty much every single year. Um, the trees in the picture you just saw before, those trees are about 40 years old now, and they've made a crop every single year since 19, since 19, early 1980s. Um, so this is a tree that's really reliable. And if you think about reliability of crop, of a tree crop, hold on one second, sorry. Um, if you think about the reliability of a tree crop, 
it's not just for us, which is really important. Like if we want to grow something, we like to have a crop every single year, but it makes a huge difference to wildlife. So if you have a, if you have a tree that is part of an ecosystem and it makes a crop one year and then the next year it doesn't and the next year it doesn't and then it does again, which is pretty much what most trees are going to do, um, especially in the wild. Most trees are going to set mat, they're going to have mast years like the oaks do that, right? And the beaches do it, you know, walnuts do that. So um, one of the trees I work with a lot is hickory and they have a good crop every two or three years. And that's normal, that's fine. But if, if you have a forest of hickory and all the animals come and they're gathering nuts and they're using those nuts as a staple and there's no crop the next year, that's pretty tough. You start having boom and bust population cycles where there's a ton of food and they can grow their population. And then all of a sudden there's no food. And uh, you know, I know everybody's like COVID, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't think we've really ever experienced a boom and bust population cycle as humans. Um, and that's what has happened. That's what happens to a lot of wildlife since the chestnut was taken away as a backbone of the ecosystems in the Northeast and a lot of different regions. But anyways, so if you imagine a tree that produces a crop every single year, you're able to have more stable populations. You don't have to have that boom and bust. Um, these flowers are primarily wind pollinated, but they're also used a lot by pollinators and honeybees and stuff like that. And chestnut honey is a, is a real product, uh, especially in Europe. But you know what's weird about these flowers is they, they smell horrible. I don't know if everyone's ever smelled chestnut flowers, but it's one of the worst smelling flowers I can imagine, um, but they are beautiful and uh, they come out around the first week of July. Um, next slide, please. So my, my screen is weird. I can't even see the whole picture, but uh, I think I know what I'm looking at. So there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different species of chestnut. So when I'm talking about chestnuts, I'm talking about the genus. The genus is Castania or Castanea however you want to say it. And there's different players, right? So just like there's different kinds of oaks, there's red oaks and white oaks and bur oaks and swamp white oaks and post oaks and all these different kinds. There's all different kinds of chestnuts too. And, and they all have a, a similar origin, right? All chestnuts came from one place. And then as time went on, they drifted apart from continents separating from mountain ranges going up, all kinds of factors have led to the dispersal of this genus. So the chestnuts, they had all this, not, this is the way I think of it at least, they had all this knowledge and then they went out into different places and learned more things. So the American chestnut has a had a population up into Maine and this population is hardy to negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And then there's another uh, type of chestnut that lives in Japan and that and the Castanea Cronata, uh, which is what this picture is of. And that one learned all about resisting certain diseases like chestnut blight and ink disease. And then there's other ones that lived in, you know, more arid regions and ones that lived in more humid regions and ones that lived with certain insects and ones that lived with certain fungi. And so basically all these different species of chestnut are living in different parts of the world for millions of years. And while they're doing this, they all adapt to those environments. And now um, what's happening is we are in a position where the world is changing and we can offer these trees their own knowledge. We can bring it all back together. This is what, hybrid, this is what hybridization is, is we're taking one species and crossing it with another. And the thing about chestnuts is they, they want to do it. They, they naturally do it. If you have one species of chestnut next to another species, even in the same area, they will pollinate each other. And the nut that comes, the seed that comes from that will contain information from both species. And so you can start to do amazing things with chestnuts. You can start to have trees that are very blight, resi they're resistant to diseases. You can have trees that are very cold hardy, trees that are very heat tolerant. You can pretty much uh, almost like clay, you can shape these, these trees into uh, more adaptable organisms. 
Um, so I'm just going to talk about, and that's that's just my take on on hybrids. Um, I'm not talking about genetic engineering or anything. I'm just talking about taking knowledge of different species and bringing it together. So I'm going to talk about some of the different players, some of the different species. Um, so the Japanese chestnut is uh, shown here in this picture. is a, is a very uh, all of the species are very long lived except for one. Um, and uh, the Japanese chestnut, very long lived, very big, very strong tree. Probably the most notable features about it is it can produce some of the largest nuts. They're harder to peel generally, um, but they're the biggest and it's the most disease resistant. So the resistance to chestnut blight, which is the most important disease right now, is, uh, is a spectrum. No, no tree is like immune to it, but there's different levels of resistance. And the Japanese chestnut has the highest level of resistance by far. It also has the highest level of resistance to ink disease, which is a problem for Southern, southern growers um, and maybe for Northern ones in the future. Um, the other thing about uh, Japanese chestnut is called Castanea cronata, and it's, it's from Japan. And this is actually where chestnut blight uh, came to the US from. Um, another species, uh, similar to Japanese chestnut is the Chinese chestnut. And the Chinese chestnut is planted, is the most widely planted species of chestnut in America. Unfortunately, we don't really, we don't really have it. Like what we've did is we took a very small portion of it. So the Chinese chestnut has a huge range in China. It goes all the way from Southern China to, to Northern China near Korea. Um, this is an enormous country with a wide range of climates. And when we took this one species, this species has a lot of variation in it, just like humans, right? It's a lot of variation within the species. Um, but the, the Chinese chestnut, it's uh, when we took it to America, when it got brought to the United States, it was only brought from one region of China that was a zone nine region. So Chinese chestnut, we have reports of it in the states here say like oh it's hardy it's cold hardy to you know zone six maybe zone five but it really we're not representing the whole species of chinese chestnut and chinese chestnut also has a wide range of blight resistance some populations are very blight resistant some not so much um next slide please Um, this is another species. I don't know if you can even tell what you're looking at here. This is a crazy picture, right? Um, this is one tree that has been cut down, actually cut down and burned down a couple times. Um, and it just keeps sending up uh, root suckers. Uh, this is one example of just one tree from the European chestnut, Castanea sativa, or also called the sweet chestnut. I don't know why, because they're not any sweeter than a lot of other chestnuts. But uh, the European chestnut tree is a magnificent tree. It is one of it is just astounding. This tree is reported to be over three thousand years old. It's called the it's called the hundred horse chestnut. Um, it's not a horse chestnut, which is totally different. I'm not even talking about horse chestnuts today. But the hundred horse chestnut in this picture, it's over three thousand years old. Has a circumference of one hundred ninety feet. So. If I were to put my arms around a tree and I could just barely touch my fingertips together, that tree would be a six feet in circumference. But this tree is 190 feet in circumference. This is so big, you could park a school bus behind it and you wouldn't see it on the other side. Um, and it got its name 100 horse chestnut because in the 1500s, there's this trees and she's traveling with her entourage of 100 horsemen and they get caught in this thunderstorm and they all took refuge under this canopy of this one tree. And so they named it the 100 horse chestnut and the tree's still living today and it still bears nuts every year. Uh, the European chestnut is, is a really amazing tree. It's, it's, uh, it comprised huge forests in Europe, uh, especially throughout uh, Northern Italy, um, but also France, Spain, uh, throughout most of Europe, the European chestnut uh, grows. Um, it's, it does make large nuts, but also a lot of the wild ones make very small nuts. Um, and it's very blight susceptible, very blight susceptible. In fact, the European forests were almost totally decimated. Uh, what happened was when chestnut blight arrived in Europe, it was a little before World War II and it was horrible. The chestnut forests were dying very fast 
and the American forests had already collapsed. And so they thought that the European forests were also doomed and people were, were just expecting that this was the end of the European chestnuts. But World War II happened, everybody kind of forgot about it because they were busy. And then when the war ended, they looked around at the forests again and the European chestnuts were fine. And the reason was they found that a virus had come and the virus was making the fungus, chestnut blight is a fungus, was making the fungus sick. And that's what saved the European chestnuts. Of course, life is very fluid and the virus has continued to evolve as the blight has continued to evolve. And now the European chestnut forests are starting to collapse again. Um, there's many strains of the blight and many strains of the, uh, the, the, of the virus. Um, but breeding efforts are significant underway in Europe. And what they're doing is they cross European chestnuts with Japanese chestnuts. Um, next slide, please. There's a beautiful picture of uh, European chestnuts growing in Spain. Next slide. All right, this is one of my favorite species of chestnut. So, so cool. This is, uh, so the, for the most part, chestnuts are huge trees, right? But this is a shrubby species. And there, this is a chinkapin chestnut. And chinkapins are about the size of a, of a small blueberry. Um, they're, they're like the size of a small blueberry, which seems really small because it is. But the thing about it is that it's like you take all the flavor of a chestnut and you just squeeze it down into this little tiny nut. And chinkapins, all chestnuts have very thin shells. And chinkapins have very thin shells. You can just, I mean, when I eat chinkapins, I just throw them in my mouth and spit the shells out, kind of like sunflower seeds. And uh, they are very, very sweet. They definitely don't need to be cooked to, to bring the flavor out. They're sweet right away. Um, you can dry them, uh, eat them. Um, and they grow as shrubs. They get about 15 feet tall and maybe 15 feet wide if they're out in the open sun. And they rain down copious amounts of these tiny little nuts. It's excellent food for, for turkeys and um, all kinds of songbirds will go after them, especially jays and crows, um, which I guess people wouldn't really call songbirds. But uh, chinkapins are just awesome wildlife trees and really great for people. And I found the best way to collect them is just lay a tarp down under the chinkapin bush and sh shake or breathe the branches. Um, there's other types of chinkapin. Chinkapin just means that it has one nut per burr. So the other chestnuts, I'm pretty sure we have, I have pictures later, have three nuts per burr. This is just one nut per burr. That's all chinkapin means. There's, there's a, a tree in China that does that, Castanet Henryi. And then there's another one in the United States, which for some reason they haven't credited with being a full species, but uh, it's the Ozark chinkapin. And, it's an 80 foot tall tree that makes a nut the same size as this. This is the Allegheny chinkapin. Um, and that the Ozark chinkapin is one of the most endangered trees in the world. There's very few left. And there are people working to restore this tree. And I wish more people were because it's a really amazing tree native to the Ozark plateau. Next slide, please. All right, so then this is a species that everybody's most excited about um, with good, for good reason. Um, this is the American chestnut, also called the redwood of the east. And these trees were, you know, 200 feet tall. Generally, like I walk around in a healthy forest in New York State and the trees are 70 feet tall. Um, these are 200 foot tall trees, 13 foot diameter trunks. You know, a 13 foot diameter trunk is a phenomenal thing to think about, especially when you think about it being made of chestnut wood. There are stories that the American chestnut forest, when you would walk through them, that the nuts would be knee deep. And uh, I didn't really believe that until I saw this picture. Um, next slide, please. That had a range from Maine down to Georgia. Looks like it goes over in Ohio where all you folks are at. And uh, the cool thing about the American chestnut or sad thing or whatever thing is that it was dominant. It, it really ruled in its range. It, it was about 25% of the trees in its range were American chestnut. Now today, the ash trees are all dying from world ash borer. 
and you can see it, you know, all the bark's falling off and everywhere you go, you're like, oh my God, there's so many ash trees and they're all dying. And it's usually like the most, one of the most common trees they feel like. Well, when I look around and I see ash trees are just everywhere, they make up 7% of the trees in my state, 7%. The American chestnut was 25%. This is a very, very common tree. The, the Eastern United States is the second most diverse temperate forest in the world. And uh, so if it's gonna have 25% of the species be, be just this one species, that's really saying a lot. Um, and in some areas, in my county, American chestnut was 50% of the species. It really, it really liked ridges and it formed huge, huge uh, blocks, monocultures basically, where it would take over hillsides and ridgelines. Um, and it, it was, it was a, a, a extremely dominant tree. Next slide, please. And the wood of the American chestnut. So like, I'm gonna talk about the nuts, but the wood is really phenomenal. The wood of different species is not all the same. The American chestnut has the best wood. It's, it's like, if you're a woodworker, then you might understand some of these things. So it doesn't, it doesn't warp when it dries, right? It doesn't twist or bend or like a lot of woods will do when it's drying. It's very straight grained. It's very light. It's like as light as pine. You can put a nail through it just as easy as you can a pine two by four. And, but it's also very strong and, and uh, it was, it's like if you had a tree that could do some of everything, that's kind of what the American chestnut was. It's as more rot resistant than black locust and it's easy to work as white pine. It was used from, for everything from furniture to trim, to beams, to fence posts, to, to uh, cutting boards, right? You could use it for pretty much anything. My house has tons of uh, chestnut in it because it's an old house. And it's, it's a lot of the beams are made out of chestnut. And it was maybe the most valuable, useful and durable woods that uh, I think humans have ever had access to. Next slide, please. This is a, a paper mill and uh, where they were, they were taking chestnut. This is all chestnut. All, that, all those logs in that picture are chestnut and they were, they were making paper and when in the paper making process, they would extract the tannins out of the wood and use it for leather making. Um, just, just to give you an idea of how many different things chestnuts were used for, that the wood was used for. Next slide, please. This is a nut processing facility in the United States a long time ago. And so like today we're like really familiar with certain tree crops, right? Like apples, we like know apples. And you, you know what it's like to bite into an apple. You know what cider smells like. You know what apple pie is. You know what apple sauce is. You know what dried apples are. You're very familiar with apples, right? So I'm going to do this. This presentation should really be like seven hours, but it's only one hour. So I'm going to go quick. That's why I'm talking so fast. Um, imagine that you're like in your garden, you're working, you have an apple tree in the corner. And one day in the middle of summer, you look and the tree's uh, dying. And you're like, oh crap, the apple tree's dying. And then you tell your friend, you know, my apple tree died. And he's like, mine too. And then uh, you hear on the radio, disease mysteriously wipes out all apples. And, uh, and you're like, oh my God. And before you know it, like 10 years go by, all the apple trees are gone. And you're just like, man. And you start trying to like tell people about, you start trying to tell people like years later, you know, like they, years go by, all the apple trees are dead. There's none left. You don't see apples in stores anymore. Orchards are bulldozed. You just like forget about it after a while. But then you're older and you start telling younger people, you know, when I was, you know, when I was younger, we had apples and they were really good and you would bite into them and it'd be like this and you'd be so familiar with it. But people are like, what are you talking about? Well, that's what it's like with chestnuts. People used to be so familiar with chestnuts. They were a huge part of, of the diet in the United States. When people in the fall, would gather chestnuts, they filled trains, train cars with chestnuts up and down the East Coast. Families would go in the woods, they would forage for chestnuts and they would bring sacks down to the train depots and they would sell chestnuts on the street to New York, Philadelphia, Boston. And this was a really normal, common thing. There's songs written about it and uh, people just knew the chestnut. Next slide, please. And 
as people were so familiar with this chestnut, all of a sudden, boom, one day chestnuts are gone, right? Uh, they just started dying. And people didn't know what was happening at first. It was pretty scary. These are huge trees. These are huge forests, all of a sudden turning brown and disappearing. The chestnut blight started in uh, 1904 in the United States. Um, it's a fungus that was brought over on nursery stock from Japan and people just trying to plant Japanese chestnut trees for gardens and stuff because Japanese chestnuts are great trees. Um, but they accidentally brought this blight with them, this little fungus that wasn't harming the Japanese chestnut, but it was carrying it. And the blight was like, it, it just was perfect conditions. It just took right off. The American chestnut had basically almost no resistance. And within 25 years, something like 4 billion trees were dead. It, it was a, a big deal. And people tried everything they could think of to stop it but nothing really worked. Um, one of the worst things, one of the worst, people had a lot of different ideas about what to do. Uh, just like now the ash trees are dying and people have a lot of different ideas about what to do, right? Well, one of the ideas at the time uh, promoted by the US Forest Service was get your wood, get the wood out of there now where you can still make some money because otherwise there's gonna be wormholes in it and nobody wants to buy wormy chestnut, which is worth a fortune right now. But back then they thought it was bad. so. So they just went through and they started clear cutting American chestnuts to get all the money out that they could because they were so sure that all the trees would die, uh, which they probably would have. But we don't know if there was blight resistant individuals that were destroyed in that process. Um, one thing I will say about the chestnut blight that's very interesting. The way this fungus works is it, it gets into any little crack in the bark and, and then it goes under the bark and it feeds on the cambium layer, right? and girdles the tree and it'll spread throughout the, just feeding on the cambium and it'll spread throughout the tree, killing the tree. And then as it spreads, it goes down to the root system. And when it gets to the roots, it stops, completely stops. And the reason is because there's other fungus in the soil, other fungi in the soil that it's just too much competition and chestnut blight doesn't like competition and it can't handle it and it stops. And a lot of these trees would actually survive um, in their roots and then they would send up suckers and then the you know root sprouts and then those sprouts would get blight later. So the fungus, it pretty much, it just kills the tops of trees, but it weakens them so much that it does kill them and it'll keep killing the tops over and over until the tree's dead. And the blight is able to lay dormant in the woods for decades. So uh, it's still here. I have chestnut blight all over my hill. Um, next slide, please. So, this is a picture I, uh, I took in Connecticut. So like I was saying, there was a lot of different responses to what are we gonna do? All these trees are dying. Oh my God, it's so sad. We love chestnut trees. And everybody had different responses, right? Forest Service had theirs. There were some people that thought we should uh, put like nuclear radiation on the nuts, which they actually tried. Um, and, then, uh, and then one of the best things that I think anybody did was this guy, Arthur Graves. He wasn't a professional, he, he didn't, he wasn't a researcher, he wasn't a breeder. He was just a young man who saw all these forests dying around him in Connecticut and it bothered him a lot. And what he did, his response was beautiful. He just started planting as many trees as he could, but he didn't just plant like anything. He planted every kind of chestnut he could from all around the world. He put ads in newspapers, he wanted American chestnuts, he wanted Chinese chestnuts, Japanese chestnuts, Seguin chestnuts, Henry chestnuts, every, anything, chinkapins. And then he would plant them and then cross them, mix. And he planted something like 20,000 trees on his uh, parents' estate. And uh, those, those trees are some of the most complex hybrids. Some of them have you know six different species mixed in there. And his, he worked on it till he died. And when he died, he left his land to the state of Connecticut and they took over that breeding program as Sleeping Giant State Park is, is half of that plantation. And the other half is a Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And you can actually write to the Connecticut Ag Station and, and request seeds or cuttings from these trees. Um, or you can go visit and collect as many seeds as you want. It's a really beautiful place. And uh, if you're ever in the area in the fall, it's well worth the trip. It's 
It's actually the largest repository of chestnut genetics in the world um, right now. And uh, so anyway, Arthur Graves did that. And then um, next slide, please. So that's where these nuts came from is, so he didn't, he was trying to, to, to replace the American chestnut that was lost. And he didn't really do that. But what he did was he found a lot of diversity in, in this genus. And he found a lot of trees that didn't really become forest trees, but they became beautiful, healthy, long-lived trees with really great nuts. And um, that's, those are the nuts that I use in my nursery as the backbone of our breeding programs here. And, uh, and that's what we use, uh, not just for our seed, but for all the different products uh, we experiment with as far as making different types of chestnut food. Um, so that's just like the kind of like the background story of these different species and the story of the American chestnut. And, where, and I, I think I'll say a little bit more about where we're at today, um, although I'm starting to run out of time. Um, but basically, there are different programs in place. There's like a genetic engineering place in uh, New York State. Um, and then there's the American Chestnut Foundation, which is actually part of that program. And, uh, but so those, those groups are really focused on the American chestnut. They wanna save that species. They're not really thinking about, about the genus. And for me, I'm not thinking about anything other than the nuts and the trees and what they do. I don't really care what, what species there are. I don't even really believe in classification, to be honest. I think it's just life mixing with itself. Um, but, uh, but there are blight resistant trees definitely available in all types of form. There's ones you can get that are timber form, ones that you can get that are more orchard form, ones that are shrub form. Um, there's a lot of chestnut genetics available to us today. Uh, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the nuts. We'll have a few minutes. Next slide, please. Um, so when you're harvesting chestnuts, they come in these burrs, right? The burrs. When I first started harvesting chestnuts, I was like, this tree is perfect, except for these burrs are horrible. They're so spiky and thorny. Like it, there's actually a, a tiny bit of silica on the end of each thorn. That's glass. And uh, it, it's irritating. And it, 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 when you touch one of those burrs, it, it breaks a little piece off in your skin and it feels horrible. I've had them fall on my head. I've had them fall on my hands and my neck. Like I've had them all over. Like sometimes my hands are, are a mess if I'm spending too much time touching chestnut burrs. But then I started to understand the chestnut burr is incredible. It's the only squirrel proof container that I've found in nature. And it actually protects the nut from predation until it's ripe. And when it's ripe, the chestnut burrs open and they drop the nuts. And some, some trees will drop them, drop the nuts out of the burr and some will drop them in the burr. But if they're in the burr, I just step on the burr. I just wear good shoes and I just step on the burr and the nuts pop out. And then I collect them all with uh, nut wizards. And chestnut harvest are, is really fun. It's about two weeks a year. And we just go every day and pick up as many chestnuts as we can uh, for like two weeks. Next slide, please. Um, these are chestnuts drying on the counter at home. And I bet everybody wishes their counter looked like that in the fall. But uh, when you're when you're drying chestnuts, it's um, or when when you're collecting chestnuts, these are just collected and they're just drying from like the rain or the dew or whatever, so they don't get moldy. Um, once you're at this point, what can you do with these nuts? It's kind of like what can you do with like cornmeal or something, or what can you do with um, flour? You know what I mean? There's or potatoes. Like there's so many different directions you can take it. There's so many different directions. There's fresh roasted chestnuts and, and then there's boiled chestnuts and, and then there's candied chestnuts. And then what I really like to do is I like to make them into flour. Next slide, please. Um, so these are just chestnuts roasting. Um, I've roasted them for people on the street. You can, I think you can sell as many nuts as you can roast. Um, everybody's, when you start roasting chestnuts on the sidewalk, people are gonna stop. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are boiled chestnuts. And with boiled chestnuts, you can just eat them or you can just like throw them in the uh, food processor and make them into a meal and then just form them into patties and fry them up like, like uh, kind of like fry bread. Or you can 
make it into like a wet dough and make cookies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are chestnuts that I'm drying. When you dry chestnuts, like dehydrate them, um, you don't have to put them in a dehydrator, uh, but I just dry them on, uh, on screens over the wood stove, or I also build this rack that works really well um, with a fan on top. But basically you just dry them until they rattle inside the shell and then they will keep for years. They have a shelf life that just seems to be indefinite, just like storing rice or something. Next slide, please. Um, here we are uh, just at the table, just separating chestnuts uh, from shells after running them through a cracker. Next slide, please. And here we're uh, sifting flour. We like, I just ground up the flour in a cheap corn grinder. I was like, 20, like a $20 corn grinder. And, uh, and with this chestnut flour, you can do so much things. You can make like oatmeal or like a gruel out of it. Um, people, people have survived off chestnuts like throughout history and all around the temperate world. Um, but you can also make really excellent foods. So the, if you were to research like French pastry recipes or Italian pastry recipes, they almost always call for chestnut flour. Next slide, please. And the reason is because it's so good. These are chestnut cookies. Uh, I don't cut it with wheat. A lot of the recipes cut, ask for you to cut it with wheat, but I found that if it's just chestnut flour, it's pretty awesome. Um, and the cookies and the cake, uh, chestnut cake, is just phenomenal. There's really, there's really like no better flour for desserts in my mind. This is a gluten-free flour, uh, paleo or whatever. It's very easy to market. It tastes delicious. Um, it's, it's a very consumable, easy to use product. Um, there's a lot of reasons I believe in chestnut flour, but I don't think I'll have time to really get into it. I could have done the whole presentation on chestnut flour. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then this is, uh, so, that, so that was just like a brief thing on how to use chestnuts. There's so much more I could say, right? It, it really could have just write like a whole book about chestnuts um, and people have, um, even in just, one aspect of it. Uh, here, this is a, a seed storage pit. And so if you wanna propagate chestnuts, um, there's a lot of places you can get seed from. My farm is one of them, but there's also lots of others. Um, in fact, you guys are in Ohio and uh, what's that? Root, Root 9 Cooperative Empire Chestnut Company, I think it's called. They're one of a, a great source for chestnut seed. Um, and this is a, a chestnut seed pit that I made has hardware cloth on the bottom and the top. And so nothing can get in, it's all fitted together. So nothing can get in. And I just mix chestnuts and soil. And in the spring, I plant out the nuts. Next slide, please. And here's chestnuts emerging from the soil. I think those are actually chinka pins. Um, I usually grow chestnuts for a year in the nursery before I dig them up and sell them, sometimes two years. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a really nice one-year chestnut tree uh, with one, one of my kids. And uh, I always plant trees around now, spring or fall. I don't like to plant trees in the summer. And uh, this is a tree being planted in the fall. It's probably October when it got dug up and planted, maybe November. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a... Um, so here, the most important thing for growing chestnuts, I know I'm pretty much out of time, but the most important thing for growing chestnuts is that they have good drainage. And uh, so like where I live, the hills, the hills are, there's wild chestnuts. Like I can find, I can go out in the hills and find wild chestnuts. But then in my field, when I started planting chestnuts, they weren't growing well. And I didn't really understand why until I looked closer and I saw that the forests are different than the fields in, in the way the ground is shaped all the fields have been smoothed out and the water table is consistent all the way across. But in the woods, it's all lumpy and bumpy from pits and mounds, centuries of trees falling over. And so I started just making mounds and planting chestnuts onto mounds. And they, once I started doing that, they started growing really well. I've been doing that for 12 years now and the trees are thriving in, with this uh, pit and mound system. Uh, this chestnut tree in the picture is probably four years old. They're pretty fast growers if they have good drainage protection from deer. And uh, just like fruit trees, you don't want rodents chewing, the rodents will chew on them, deer will chew on them, um, and they need good drainage. 
I was, if I say good drainage, I should say it 10 more times because chestnuts really need good drainage. But if you don't have good drainage, you can make mounds or berms. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, here's chestnuts growing on a small swale. Next. And this is uh, my book, Trees of Power. And trees, that book highlights uh, 10, different tree tre 10 different trees. Each one kind of has a different niche that it fills. Um, chestnuts is one of the trees. And then the picture of the oil, that's uh, New York Tree Crops Alliance. This is a group of nut growers that I'm a part of. And mostly we're working on creating uh, a processing facility for making things like chestnut flour and hazelnut oil and hickory oil. Um, so I think I'm supposed to stop around now and answer uh, any questions or, or whatever. So is that right? That's right. Thank you, Akiva. That was really wonderful. You have quite a few people in the chat box singing your praises at the moment. So it's really nice um, to hear all of that. A lot of that I certainly didn't know. So what we can do is go into the Q&A box here and start with those. And then also, as we were collecting registrations, we also got some questions from those too that we can move to. So the first one is, my grandparents used to have a Chinese chestnut and I would like to take a cutting to grow a new one. Is the Chinese chestnut, as the name su suggests, an introduced species? And does it have value for wildlife in the United States or the Midwest? Sure. Um, well, I think if you want to try to root a chestnut cutting, if you root one, I don't want to come study with you because I don't think anybody can really root chestnut cuttings. They're extremely, uh, pretty much close to impossible to root. Um, even in tissue culture, that people struggle with it. So you're going to have to grow it from seed if you want to propagate that tree, or you could graft it. Uh, but to graft it, you'd have to have a chestnut seedling. Um, the other part of that question um, is, yes, it's an introduced species. Um, does it have wildlife value? Absolutely. I think, the, I think ecologically, the Chinese chestnut is going to perform many of the same ecological functions as, as uh, a native chestnut would. Um, but uh, also in the Midwest, there really wasn't that many native chestnuts anyways. Um, but ecologic, but the whole, I don't know, this is like a whole debate, but the world's a mess. Like, I don't think you're gonna make it any worse by adding a chestnut tree to it. Um, you're just gonna create, you're just gonna be adding an organism that feeds a lot of wildlife. And I mean, everything from like, from like chipmunks to, bears it, and everything in between and birds. And also, I don't think I mentioned this, but you do have to have two chestnut trees for pollination. They will not pollinate themselves. Okay. Um, where did the name of your farm come from? Um, kind of a personal story, but basically there's this tree that uh, it, it's, it's, it's this remarkable apple tree on our hill that uh, you can't tell if it's two trees or one tree, but they're, it's like wrapped around itself or each other and they're supporting each other. And, um, and it, it happened, it was like all this synchronicity, but, uh, it had something to do with, uh, my wife who, um, a lot of things happen. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of your book, which you have up on the screen here, would you do a quick overview of that for folks who haven't read it yet? Sure. Um, like the, the beginning of the book kind of goes into my philosophies on um, humans' relationship with the earth. And we really can do anything. We're just a lot of energy. We're just like all this energy. And so we can... It's like if you took uh, if you took a chainsaw and you walked in the woods, you could you could thin out a forest and make it healthier, or you could just cut your leg off, right? It's just energy, <laughs> and it's like uh, it's like you're swinging a hammer around, and you you're walking around the earth and you're just like swinging this hammer around, but you don't even notice you have a hammer. Like so, I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but if if you can notice that you have all this power and all this, all these tools 
at your fingertips, you can start using them consciously. Cause right now we're, people are using all this energy unconsciously and we're just kind of doing things. We're impacting ecosystems wherever we go in the management of our lawns, the management of our landscapes, um, the foods we eat. We're just always impacting and affecting the ecosystem. So first part's really about making that a conscious choice and, and improving, improving things, basically making more wildlife, more food for people. Um, and then, and then the book goes into details of how to plant trees, how to propagate trees, whether by seed cuttings, layering or grafting. And then I talk about 10 different specific trees. Um, I'm not sure I can list them off the top of my head, but uh, you know, black locust, elderberry, hickories, hazelnuts, chestnuts, uh, beeches, poplars, ash, apples, and probably a couple others I can't think right now. But uh, I don't know. It was fun writing the book. I don't even know why I did it. But. It was very good. Um, going a little bit more specific now, we have some questions just about, um, first of all, could you go over a little bit more about the pit and mound system that you're using? Yeah, it's pretty much been a game changer for my farm. So I am on uh, Volusian soil, which is like the worst soil you could have in New York State. It's uh, heavy, heavy clay. And uh, so I, I would look around and there's like forests all around our fields and they're full of huge trees, but no trees that I would plant were growing when I started. And and I would add compost and mulch, but it would like just get washed out because water table would come right to the surface and trees need to breathe. They really need to breathe. Um, so um, when I, I spent a lot of time in the woods and I'd see in the woods, there's all these pits and mounds. This is just a tree topples over, the root system kicks up and, the, and there's a, a pit where the tree was. And then there's a mound where the root system has, has come up. And, uh, and this is the most beautiful design. All it is, if you look at a series of pit and mounds, it's just vernal pools and raised beds all over the place. That's what the woods are. And so they're catching water, storing it, you get things. And vernal pools are amazing. Vernal pools are not ponds. Vernal means spring, right? So the, these they are small enough that they fill with water in the spring uh, from the winter and stuff. But then in the summer, they dry up. So fish can never get established in there. And fish get around on you know, they, get, they, they, they go all over the place, even though people don't think they do. If you make a hole and it fills with water, you're gonna get fish in it because birds' legs are gonna carry eggs around. Um, so anyways, the pit is just water some of the year. And because fish don't get in there, uh, lots of amphibians are able to reproduce very easily. Uh, so you get salamanders and all kinds of frogs and stuff. And then, um, and it stores water, it sinks water into the soil, it catches it, it stops water from running down the hill. Um, and then the mound is just, uh, it's like a raised bed and it doesn't, it's not enormous, but it's big enough that the crown of the root system is, is healthy. And as long as the crown is well-drained, it makes a huge difference. The tree can live for a very, very long time growing on a single mound surrounded by saturated soil. Um, I've observed this in nature for a very long time. Um, but, uh, you don't have to make pits and mounds. I did because I have these, uh, Volusian soils. If I just had like nice soil, uh, like that drained well, I would just plant the trees in the ground. Um, but I, because it would just be easier, especially for mowing, but uh, mowing around them. But uh, but the pits and mounds really work. If you have crappy soil, make make mounds big. The bigger the better. Um, I make them with my front motor, but whatever you can use works. Um, okay, let's see here. Another one is about air pruning of roots. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I talk about that in the book. Uh, I, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I do. And uh, basically, it's just a system. So if you have uh, some trees are really hard to transplant. And it's really hard to go out in the in like a field and just plant a seed of a tree and then have it become a tree because you need excellent weed control to establish trees for the most part. Um, you can't just throw seeds in the ground and walk away. Nature does, but nature's throwing millions and millions of seeds. 
So if you're just, maybe you have a hundred seeds and you really wanna make sure they work, then you need to start them in a nursery setting and then transplant them to their final location. Um, but some trees don't wanna transplant. You know, transplanting is not a very natural thing. So with tap-rooted species, air pruning really makes this possible. Uh, so like, for example, if you wanted to grow a hickory nut in a nursery and it's gonna make, if you just plant a nut in a garden bed or it'll just make a root that'll go down, you know, a couple feet and then it'll send up like a little three inch top. And, and that's, that's year one, right? Um, and that's, and if you sever that tap root, a lot of times it will kill the tree. In fact, most of the time. So air pruning is, uh, it's just a system where you make a bed that's raised up off the ground and the bottom of the bed is hardware cloth, like a thick metal screen. And, and there's a gap between the bottom of that bed and the ground. You know, it doesn't matter how much, just enough that, you know, you can at least fit your hand under there. And so the tree's gonna send out a root. It's gonna send it straight down to the bottom of the bed. When it gets to the bottom of the bed, it's going to touch the air. And instead of having the tap root like severed by a shovel or something, it's just a little hair, you know, roots lead with a hair. And so it, it feels the air there and it's like, oh, there's nothing there. There's no soil there. So it gets pruned off there. And just like pruning the top of a tree, pruning a root does the same thing. So if you cut the top of a tree off, it'll make, it'll bush out. It'll make all these branches. So if you have the, the tip of the root is, is uh, killed by the air, then the rest of the root is going to bush out and make like hundreds of hairs. And then you can just pull the tree. And then after a year, after a single growing season, you just pull the tree out of the air prune bed. And it's very easy to transplant um, instead of having a tree with like one thick root, like a carrot shape, you have something that's more like, like a short carrot with a ball of hair all around coming out of all sides of it. And uh, they transplant really well. Um, that's what, that's why I use air prune beds. Wonderful. That was really great. We learned so much with you tonight, Akiva. Thank you so much again for joining us and coming all the way over from New York. I know traffic was bad and yeah, all of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we really appreciated it. And um, everybody go ahead and put a thank you if you want to into the chat box. I know Akiva would really appreciate that. I don't care about things. Um, one thing I want to say though is, um, I have a, a propagation online propagation class that starts up in a couple of days. So mm. if anybody wants to go check out Twisted Tree Farm, you can read about our class. So. Twisted Tree Farm. You'll find it. If you Wonderful. Like that. That's perfect. That aligns perfect with this. I bet you're very busy also with everything yeah. you have going on with spring and oh, a lot. Well, thank you, Akiva, again. Everybody, we hope to see you again next month for our next Tree University speaker um, with Bill Johnson, who's a, a local, not from New York this time. He's here from um, Central Ohio and he grows a lot of different fruits. So we have a lot we can learn from him about uh, brambles even, and um, he'll talk about apples, I'm sure, pawpaws and all the other things. Um, it'll, it'll be really wonderful. Bill's really funny and it's gonna be a very engaging presentation. So we hope you'll enjoy, you'll join us for that. Um, and everybody, I hope you all have a very nice evening and we'll hopefully see you tomorrow morning for Arbor Day celebration. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Akiva.